Okay, well, we're going to start the, the program. And um, I thought that um, our company, Aguilar Productions, for the past 17 years has been promoting and producing Hispanic marketing conferences. And um, one of the things that, um, that our message to our business uh, community here in Minnesota was that we need to be aggressive and we need to be successful going after the Hispanic market. Well, everybody knows that um, right now this it's over a trillion dollars in buying power. The word's out. That's why we're here now. The word's out about the vote. So we put together this piece that we that we do um, because you know the Latino community is not monolithic. There's there's so many different countries and so many um, so many so much variety and so much history between a lot of these countries. So we want to make sure that as marketers, as as um, as people that are involved in politics, we want to make sure who is that community. So we put together this piece, um, and my good Latino friend, uh, Mike McLaughlin, a good Irish friend, he actually put this together, and I want you to enjoy this. And I do have some, I do have some words that we're going to uh, add to this in the uh, Latinos in America. Mike, get a click on it. We sit here today at the brink of a newly defined America. The last vision of America will impact total U.S. culture. While some experts thought that technology and communications would bring us all together in a global economy, we're finding that it may be doing quite the opposite among Hispanics in the U.S. Hispanics are taking advantage of technology and communications to create new groups and cultural zones. As a result, their old national identities and behavior patterns are proving surprisingly durable. America is not assimilating into a homogeneous culture, but rather into lifestyle segments. Examples of the Latinization of America are everywhere. Segmented music, news, magazines, and television. America is different today. One in five children under the age of five is Hispanic. By 2020, Hispanics will comprise about 25% of the U.S. population. Hispanics have established themselves as a social, cultural, political, and economic force. They represent one trillion dollars in value, a figure that has risen 30% since 2001. Let's face it, this isn't a niche, it's a market. And this market will change America as we know today. So here we have a substantial future U.S. population that represents a new mix of elements, socially conservative, politically liberal, and personally traditional. We are at the brink of a new America and it will affect everything from our laws to our society to our commerce to our workplace and to our culture. Ironically 90% of Hispanics believe it is important that they blend into the larger U.S. society yet they are not assimilating. Acculturation is more the reality. For marketers keen on reaching the Hispanic consumer, this market represents a very interesting and realistic market, especially due to the fact that historically, Hispanics have not been part of the melting pot process as other immigrant groups have done in the past. 
Advertisers are faced with the challenge of having to understand a different culture, language, and overall consumer behavior. It's like a country within a country. It's up to all of us to rise to the challenge, adapt to the changing culture and align it with your strategic plans and actions. Madison Avenue once dismissed Hispanics as too poor and uneducated to be worth taking seriously. It was a big mistake then, and a monumental one today. Well, thank you. That was a, that was a look at the, at the uh, Latino community, the Latino population and groups. So now we're going to go into an um, organization that, uh, that I'm so impressed with um, and so excited about their message and, and who they are. This is the, the Libra Initiative. And uh, it was founded in 2011. Uh, the Libre Initiative is a nonpartisan, nonprofit, grassroots organization that advances the principles and values of economic freedom to empower the U.S. Hispanic community so it can thrive and contribute to a more prosperous America. Libre is dedicated to informing the U.S. Hispanic community about the benefits of constitutionally limited government, property rights, rule of law, sound money supply, and free enterprise through a variety of community events, research, and policy initiatives that protect our economic freedom. Mike, I want to have you put on the, the My American Experience. If you could put on that video for us, please. I want you to watch this. It's a, it's a strong uh, video about the Libra Initiative. My name is Daniel Garza, and My American Experience started off here. I grew up picking crops with my family. My parents were immigrants from Mexico with nothing but a fourth grade education. We were so poor. My siblings and I would often miss school to work in the fields. Our home was the size of a tool shed. It had no running water. And what we would do is warm buckets of water on the stove so that when my parents returned from work in the fields, uh, they would bathe uh, with small cups. My father never took welfare because he didn't want to depend on anyone or lose his dignity. He is a proud and noble man. We can make it with just three things. It's God, good credit, and freedom, liberty to work. And that's what the United States is. You know, I didn't know it at the time, but my father began saving money and buying and selling small properties. He bought a motel with the profit he made. My family and I spent long hours fixing up that motel while still working the fields. My father continued to buy and sell property, and one day he and my mother retired with enough money to live comfortably for the rest of their lives. If I don't come to the United States, I don't think I have the life that we got right now. Living so good, you know. My parents' American dream had become a reality. My family and I have succeeded by following the path to freedom, but that path is on the verge of vanishing. What we're starting to see here in America now is a growth in the size and the scope of government that is now starting to uh, look like the governments that we left behind. I'm just torn apart when I see folks who are caught in this uh, dependency that government offers. And not only that, they condemn their children to a life of mediocrity and subsistence. And this is not the American dream. This is an American nightmare. The Libra Initiative is reaching the Hispanic community before they are lost forever. We know advancing economic freedom is the best way to improve human well-being, especially those at the bottom. And that's our message to people. You know, one day I was speaking before a group of 150 evangelical Hispanic ministers in South Texas. And a man stood up. He had tears in his eyes and said, You know, I've never heard these things before. Why has no one told this? Most Hispanics have never even heard about economic freedom. But they know it. Cuba, <coughs> Venezuela, Mexico, Hispanic countries that have been ruled by tyranny to come to America, the land of the free. They don't just believe in the cause, 
they live. It is a privilege to live in the United States because this is a nation where you dictate your destiny. No other nation has fulfilled more dreams and more aspirations than this country. And to have been born here, uh, I'm just grateful to God. We're excited and pleased to have uh, Rachel Campos Duffy here as our keynote. And um, um, thanks to the Libra Initiative, thanks to uh, the RNC and other friends that helped uh, make this happen. Rachel is a parodying expert, author, blogger, political pundit, and television personality. She got her television start on MTV's The Real World. Currently, she is a reoccurring guest on NBC's Today Show, where she does parody and relations, relationship segments. For the past 14 years, she has been a recurring guest host on ABC's The View, appearing more than 25 times. She has also been a guest on Dr. Phil, Fox and Friends, The Hannity Show, The Mike Huckabee Show, Politically Incorrect, Huffington Post Live, EWTN's The World Over Live, and CNN where she is a frequent on-camera commentator on parody, political, politics, and culture. She also writes for National Review Online, The Huffington Post, The American Spectator, to name a few. Currently, Rachel is a national spokesperson for the Leave It Initiative, an organization that educates and advocates for economic empowerment of Hispanics through limited government, entrepreneurship, and self-reliance. Her book, published in 2009 by Penguin, is called Stay home, stay happy. Ten secrets to loving at home motherhood. Rachel has a degree in economics from Arizona State University and a master's degree in international affairs from the University of California, San Diego. She lives in Wisconsin with her husband, Congressman Sean Duffy, and her six awesome kids. Let's have a big Minnesota welcome for Rachel Campos Duffy. show them how it works and how and the results and that story is a powerful one we're actually working on one right now about my family story um, I sort of debated I, I want to show it to you it's not completed um, in that it, there's some you know post-production things there's a few glitches but I thought I'd just show it to you anyway um, so if you would just please you know forgive some of the you know things that you'll see that are but you'll get the gist of the story, and I think it might help explain and, and give some background and color to what I'm going to talk about today. For me as a parent, it's important for my kids um, to still appreciate how lucky we are to live in this country and the kind of sacrifices that their great-grandfather and their grandfather made so that they could have a better life. My name is Rachel Campos Duffy. As a mother of six, Nothing is more important to me than my family. My grandparents came from Mexico, and my father was born in a small copper mining town in Arizona. They were very poor, but they were very resourceful. And so, even as a young kid, he was a shoeshine boy. He started his own pinata business when he was only 12 years old. 
Um, so he's somebody who figured out at a very young age that what he couldn't do in Mexico, he could do in America, which was to transcend his poverty through hard work. When I was growing up, my dad was often in night school, earning his degree. And I think what he passed on to us, he didn't really tell us, he showed us. You know, Hispanics were not a monolithic group, but I think what we share, uh, the most important thing we share, is a work ethic, is a drive, is a willingness to sacrifice for the next generation. The reason why America is distinct from the rest of the world is because you can do whatever you want to do as long as you set your mind and establish your goals, you can do it. This country gave my family the freedom and the opportunity to succeed. But I'm worried that government programs that are supposed to help Hispanic families are actually doing harm. I think kids are growing up in a time when this sense of entitlement and dependency on government is starting to take over. I know how hard my dad worked. I don't want my kids to lose that work ethic. And that's why I joined Vivide, because it's an organization that mirrors the values I'm teaching my kids. Vivide's mission is to be a voice for freedom, a voice for economic liberty, a voice for self-reliance, and the belief in America that if you work hard, you can make a better life for your family. We do this person to person, heart to heart, in the communities we want to serve, offering programs that empower people. We're on the ground, fighting for the freedom and opportunity that make the American dream possible. Join us at joinlibre.org. Before I begin, Rick, I just really want to thank you for your invitation to come here. What a fantastic event you've put together um, and all the things you've done over the years. Thank you so much. Um, again, my name is Rachel Couples Duffy. I'm a Hispanic woman. I am the daughter and granddaughter of immigrants. I'm a mother of six. I'm a Catholic, and I'm a very proud conservative. Um, from a family of Mexican-American Union Democrats who worked in the Arizona copper mines. My father was one of 15 brothers and sisters. As a child, he was a shoeshine boy, as you saw in the video there. He was also a young entrepreneur who started his own little piñata business in his town when he was just 12 years old. Um, when he graduated from high school, he joined the US, the U.S. Air Force, serving the country he loves for 28 years and raising a family and working hard with my mother to achieve the American dream for me and for my siblings. But he didn't realize that he was a conservative until about 1980. So at a time when the burdens of taxes and regulation were mounting, even as American leadership around the globe was declining, Ronald Reagan spoke to my father's hopes and dreams. When my parents and grandparents immigrated to America, they didn't come here looking for government assistance. They were searching for liberty, opportunity, and prosperity. And they were willing to work very, very hard to earn it. Because Hispanics, we are not just dreamers, we are doers. And that was the America my father believed in that he worked so hard for and defended for nearly three decades. <coughs> and that is the America he wanted to pass on to his children. And so now as the burden of taxes and regulations are mounting yet again, and America's leadership in the globe is declining, it's now my turn to fight for the America that my father passed on to me. As a mom and as a Latina, I am deeply troubled by the direction of our country. You know, when the IRS spies on the Tea Party, and the DOJ spies on Fox News, and the NSA spies on all of us, America's government is beginning to resemble the dysfunctional, corrupt governments Hispanics left behind. 
But what worries me most is the spirit-crushing cycle of dependency that's ensnaring so many Americans and tragically so many of our young people. In their zeal to help this administration and the progressive activists who peddle their policies in Hispanic communities, they are telling Hispanics that we cannot make it on our own. It's a self-serving message that guarantees that we will need big government and benevolent community organizers um, that, and, and, and all the government programs to get through life. Remember, remember Julia um, from the Obama campaign? Um, recently, Democratic strategist Donna Brazil called Republicans pure and simply heartless for voting to decrease the enormous growth in food stamp spending by just a mere 5% and for enacting measures um, to increase oversight and decrease fraud in the program. In typical liberal fashion, Ms. Brazil turns notions of compassion and dignity right on its head, casting big government and its devotees as the righteous defenders of the poor and calling anyone who challenges the efficacy of government anti-poverty programs or even dares to suggest that we reinstate a work requirement, the ones that Obama gutted. If you do that, you are a heartless monster who she says, quote, kicks, and, uh, kicks poor people while they are down. A few months ago, while in South America, Pope Francis, somebody <coughs> whose love and compassion and heart for the poor can hardly be challenged, he spoke of the dignity of work and of earning one's own bread. As a fellow minority, I can tell you that I am deeply suspicious of elites, minority or otherwise, who patronize America's working poor with messages of victimhood and dependency. Instead of flicking us more crumbs off that government table, how about making it easier for us to enter the ranks of the middle class? Start businesses at two times the rate of the average America American. It seems to me that fewer regulations and dictates from Washington will do more to encourage hiring and startups and the fulfillment of American dreams. Nancy Pelosi famously said, "If you want to create jobs, the quickest way to do it is to provide more funding for food stamps." <laughs> When Obama and the Democrats' entitlement philosophy and spread the wealth economy have had such dismal results, especially for the very people that it purports to help, it is time that we, and especially we concerned minorities, confront these do-gooders with the misery and the stagnation that they are spreading. So what have these progressive policies and handouts done to our communities? and our families. Today, thanks to liberal policies that disincentivize marriage, over 50% of Hispanic babies are now born without the benefits and the blessings of stable married parents. Millions of poor minority students are trapped in substandard and even dangerous schools. I tell you, nothing gets my Latina blood boiling more than the hypocrisy of liberals who shut down voucher and choice and education <coughs> programs for children while they send their own children to elite private schools that cost more than most American and most Hispanic families make in a year. Yeah. Today, two million more Hispanics are living in poverty than the day President Obama took office. Millions more are out of work and underemployed. And the dreams we came to America in search of have never been more out of reach. Liberal policies hurt our economy. Liberal policies hurt our families. And liberal policies are hurting Hispanics. Today, Conservative organizations are spending millions of dollars trying to figure out 
Why? With stats like this, why are we losing the hearts and minds of Hispanics? Now, because Hispanics are a very matriarchal culture, the Hispanic women's vote, as Rick often talks about, is particularly important. Convince a mother, and you can win over a family. So, as a member of this politically coveted niche demographic, I have a little advice for all those fancy consultants, those pricey pollsters, those messaging gurus. Hispanics want our families to prosper, and we are willing to make tremendous sacrifices to give our children a better life. We know that the enemy of upward mobility is not other people's success. The enemy of upward mobility is apathy, dependency, and a growing culture of entitlement that denigrates earned success. We want economic liberty, jobs, and a growing, vibrant economy that can only come from the hard work and ingenuity of the private sector. <laughs> we, want, we want immigration reform that lets the free market, not unions, decide the number and kinds of guest workers and visas America's businesses and farms need. We want the right as parents to choose the best and the safest schools for our children. And we want our rights as parents restored including our rights as parents to be in charge of our own children's medical care. I ask you, I ask you, tell me, how is it that when it comes to Obamacare, the President and Kathleen Sebelius tell us that our 26-year-olds are children, but when it comes to the Plan B morning after pill, our President tells us that our 13-year-old daughters are women. The moral and cultural decay of America deeply troubles Hispanic mothers. And that is why we want our government to respect our religious liberty. A government that doesn't force Catholic schools, hospitals, and social services to violate our deeply held religious beliefs. You see, if we put labels and stereotypes aside, it's clear that Hispanics are conservatives. Ronald Reagan and Jack Kemp captured our imagination with a message of hard work and big dreams. But since then, conservatives have pretty much just stopped talking to Hispanics. And when we did, we left a vacuum. Uh, we left a vacuum in Hispanic communities that was rapidly filled by progressive do-gooders promising something for nothing and delivering mediocrity and dependency along with an array of policies that are eroding our community's moral and religious values. Today there is one organization, the Leave It Initiative, that is doing what conservatives should have been doing all along, embedding ourselves in Hispanic communities and empowering the good and hard-working, God-fearing people who live there. From English language courses, to help with tax preparation, to help starting up a businesses, the Libre Initiative offers services that empower, not enslave. We are a conservative alternative to progressive community organization. And we are on the ground, and we are on the ground building relationships, earning trust, and helping Hispanics to achieve the American dream. The Libre Initiative is proving that Hispanic hearts and minds will not be won back with slick ads, obnoxious robocalls, or soulless glossy mail pieces, even if you print them in Spanish. <laughs> if conservatives want to win back Hispanics, it's going to take personal visits, honest conversations, shoe leather, hammers, nails, venture capital, make no mistake, this is going to be very hard work. But the liberals have been doing this for generations now. 
And it's time that we, as conservatives, Hispanic and non-Hispanic, join in this fight. I invite you to visit our website at www.theleaveitinitiative.com and support Leave's mission to help Hispanics and present a clear contrast between the America progressives are selling and the timeless, limitless American dream that so many Hispanics risk their lives to come north in search of. The Libre Initiative is leading the way because economic freedom, religious liberty, and the American dream never went out of style. It never stopped capturing our imagination. It never stopped speaking to the deepest desires of the human heart. I want to thank you so much for having me here. Um, I, I'm willing to take questions if anybody has any. Any questions? Anyone? We have one right here. Where are you going? Hold on. I got a microphone. Thank you. Wow, that's so important. Um, where are the, the frictions between the, the main body of Republicans and conservatives? and the broader Latino community, or sub-communities, and where are the frictions between the Democratic Party and the broader, or specific portions of the Filipino, uh, sorry, Hispanic community. Mm -hmm. um, and I ask that because conservative is nice, but it's such a broad term, I mean, such an umbrella term, and there have to be frictions on both sides, Democrat and Republican. I'm not sure what you mean by friction, but what I will say is I do think that um, the there is a tone problem in our in our party, and um, again, I think so many of the policies that we espouse actually help Hispanics prosper, from school choice to all these issues of economic liberty. When you have a demographic that starts businesses at that rate, that are so very <laughs> entrepreneurial and have such an incredible work ethic. Um, the things that we are fighting for, the making it easier to start a business, taxes, regulation, you bet they care about those things. But the issue of immigration has been a barrier for us. Um, I would say the vast majority of Republicans recognize that we need to have immigration reform. Um, some of the harsher, um, some of the harsher voices within this party have been able to sort of hijack it in a way. And I think present a face that um, you know that uh, doesn't really, I think, reflect um, the way so many of us feel about immigrants, about Hispanics, and so we have a tonal problem. Um, and I think that the Democrats have an advantage. Um, it could be like a left brain, right brain thing, but um, they simply are better at speaking to people's hearts. Republicans are very fact-based type of people, and we like to come up with our charts and our graphs, and we want to tell you that there's $17 million in you know, debt, and people can't wrap their heads around that so easy. Um, but they can wrap their heads around what's happening in their family, and so some of it is just, how do we message that? How do we talk to people, but talk to their hearts, not to, not to charts and graphs, but how do we talk to people's um, hearts? and 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 present our policies not as these big macro solutions, but as solutions that work for individual families. Um, so I think there's a, there's a problem in that regard. Anyone else? Any further questions? Yeah, sure. Is this on? <laughs> um, I want to ask a, a very hard question. And um, please understand that, and, with all sincerity, I'm asking this as someone who's really searching. Um, I come from Austin, Minnesota. Uh, it's about 100 miles south of here. It has a long history of being a meatpacking town, as many of you know. Um, and I understand we're here to learn more about um, outreach to uh, Latino voters. I would like, and maybe not just you, but I've heard uh, a lot of people up on the, the DS today say uh, comprehensive immigration reform. And I would like to know what that, what that really means. And, here's, and one of the reasons that I want to know that is because 
when I hear you say it, when I hear Barack Obama say it, and when I hear uh, John McCain say it, um, I, have a, I have the sense that we're not all talking about the same thing. Mm -hmm. Number two, um, Austin, Minnesota is uh, about 18% Hispanic. Um, Austin, Minnesota has a long, proud, it's about a 65-35 uh, blue uh, district down there. Um, and a long time union, I mean it's a big union stronghold, um, a lot of FDR Democrats down there. And, um, you know, if I'm addressing 18% Hispanic, I have to be able to say something that, that somehow resonates with the 82%, the, uh, many of whom, um, you know, we, I retired from Hormel, and, and again, I don't, and this, don't take this the wrong way, but we would talk about uh, what our uh, industrial relations people would call the browning of the workforce. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so the, the, uh, the, that work has become work that uh, a, lot of, a lot of people in Austin look down on and, and almost won't, you know, the, the, the German Norwegians who, who worked for George, uh, you know, up through 1970, their children don't even want to go to work in that plant. And I, how do you, how do you, what does comprehensive immigration reform mean? And how do you, I mean, I get liberty and I get hard work and all that, but how do you thread the needle there to, because uh, our problem in Austin is how do I elect, as a Republican, how do I elect a candidate? That's what, I, that's what it really comes down to. So whoever's in this room who wants to address that rather long question, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm really searching for, the, uh, for what does comprehensive immigration reform mean? Does, it, does that mean a pathway to citizenship? What does that mean for Republicans versus Democrats and electoral majorities and all that sort of thing? I think it's the elephant in the room that we all wonder sure. about, but... Um, Okay. The floor back to you. Well, I, I, let me start by saying that Libre does not endorse a specific plan. We are for comprehensive immigration reform. We are for finding a solution for the millions of people that are here, living in the shadows, uh, working here, and um, and whose, many of them whose children live are, have been born here. So um, I don't endorse a specific plan as Libre. Um, if I can take that Libre hat off and speak to you just as a fellow conservative and constituent of Wisconsin 7th District, I will tell you that for me, the first thing is we need to um, deal with the guest worker situation. Um, and we need to allow the markets to decide that. So regardless of where you stand on the immigration issue, um, there's no reason why if we need more people to pick crops for exactly the reason you say, that so many um, white Americans somehow now think these jobs are beneath them. There are people who are willing to do these jobs, and if we want them to pick our crops, we ought to make, the, make it easier for them to get here and work and have some of the dignity and rights that all of us enjoy as um, contributors to this economy. Um, now, what do we do about the 11 million or so, whatever, I don't know what the number is now, they say of how many millions of, of illegals are living um, in this country. Um, you know, what, what the House is proposing is simply to legalize them. And when you say a pathway to citizenship, there's a pathway that exists. It's called our immigration system. And you can go, again, this is a perfect example of what we talk about with tone. Okay, so let's say we all agree that we should at least legalize them so they can legally exist and work in this country. We're not talking citizenship at this point, okay? So we all agree that that's probably a good thing, that people who are here living, we're not gonna deport 11 million people, or as Mitt Romney, you know, they're not gonna self-deport. Um, so we've got these people living here, and we're going to give them a legal status so that they can, you know, um, report crimes and, and all these kind of things. And so now we have the question of citizenship. What do we do about citizenship. Well, we could say that this is the pathway exists. It's the immigration system that is very tedious and annoying and has its glitches, but it exists. When Democrats say a path to citizenship, usually, and this is my interpretation, I think they mean a special pathway where they come to the front of the line. When I hear pathway to citizenship for um, 
uh, by Republican candidates, I think they mean that the path the pathway exists, and you can you have the same access once you're legalized. You have the same access as anybody else to go through the citizenship process. But now, how do Republicans tell Hispanics that? They say, you go to the back of the line. Doesn't that sound like the back of the bus? I mean, we mean the same thing. We're saying exactly the same thing. Why couldn't we just say, as Republicans, the pathway exists, and you have the same opportunity as everybody else to be part of, the, of uh, become a citizen by entering you know, the pathway to immigration, I mean, to, to citizenship. But we say, you gotta get to the back of the line. And we say that, I think, to appease some of the more radical parts of our, of our party. So that's a tonal issue. There was absolutely no difference in what, the policy outcome of that. But we are simply sending a message that we don't like them, and it's totally unnecessary. So that's an example. Well, listen, Rachel. Well, first of all, how about another round of applause? Before, before you go, before you go, you know, you know us Latinos, we always like to have gifts for our friends. And can I have the kids back up? We have a we have a recuerdo that we're going to give you from our friends. Can we can we please come up? Yes, a little faster. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I know it's lunch. Yeah, no. we, we don't. We don't want to be here for dinner, but I mean, <laughs> we, we, we have a beautiful gift. Come on up here, kids. We're going to get some photos here. We have a beautiful gift that we want to give you, Rachel. Yeah. Um, that um, that we, we like to uh, have our uh, Latinos, especially our youth, involved in this. And how about, how about they, they came for the whole conference, ladies and gentlemen? And this is our future. <laughs> Education and health. And uh, Carissa Antiveros is uh, this is her group that she started at her high school as a graduating project. She's now a junior at Hamlin University, and she's taken over the Hamlin. <laughs> That's how we engage Latinos, really, is through food and art. And so, uh, uh, these are called capias, and in Puerto Rico, a capia is a remembrance of, a, of an event, a wedding, a graduation. And so this is just a tile that we embellish. And so because it, it, we are Latinos and we are Puerto an Rico. <laughs> Uh, Rick Aguilar is always saying that it's the Latina women that's going to clean up all the messes here. Oh, yeah. yeah. So uh, we want to do that. And then we put the American flag on top of the triangle, which is Rick Aguilar's logo. Oh. And uh, we have, Rick Aguilar has a special uh, place in our heart because he's been with us for nine years, graduating kids, celebrating them. And so for a group of kids to come on a Saturday morning and get dressed up, and, and they all come from Democratic households, so you, know, you know we're all in trouble. And so we have one more. If you could please reach in here and take out the winning raffle ticket to give uh, this copy, which is a uh, magnet. And again, it's a triangle representing Rick Aguilar's uh, Aguilar production and a chile. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, do we have the winning number? I'm not sure. All right, so the last three numbers on your ticket should be 889. Eight, eight, the last three digits. 889. Eight, eight, Bingo. Wow. <laughs> So 
these are your future voters. Because yeah. we're all going to the nursing home soon. I'll see you there with my hurricane. <laughs> This is still Hispanic Heritage Month. You know, it's a long month. It used to be a week, and they gave us a month. We could use it. Yeah, then something's all about two months. You know, what the hell? But um, we're glad it's a month. But we do have a uh, we do have one more gift before we go because uh, if you're not if you're not back with us again, we want you to remember this visit at least for this year. But here's the uh, here's the, uh, uh, the Puerto Ricans, man. They take over, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah, yeah right? she, she can't even hear me. She can't even hear me now. But down. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks, family. Yeah. The bus in Puerto Rico is right outside. Okay. I'm sorry. Rick, we, we only have one more. Come on up here, Rick. We only have more. That's, that's, okay, we, we just noticed. But here's, here's, a, here's a, uh, a Hispanic. <laughs> I love this stuff. La Familia 2013 Hispanic Heritage Award. In recognition of your commitment to your Hispanic heritage and culture and your dedication and exceptional work with the Libra Initiative to expand the message of economic liberty and opportunity for the Hispanic community, also for your love of family, friends, and your country. Therefore, with the appreciation of the Hispanic community in Minnesota, this Hispanic Heritage Award is presented to Rachel Campos Duffy by the Hispanic Heritage Committee. Thank you. Okay, well, listen, before.